Hello, welcome to Zoonosis with Joy. I'm Joy, and today I'm going to talk to you about eusociality. What it is, why it's a problem for biology and for understanding life, and uh, some possible solutions to that problem. So, people have been wondering what the heck is going on with honeybees for a very, very long time. Um, you think about Aristotle, he believed that honeybees had a king, and that they were ruled like the ancient Greek city-state of Sparta, or something else like that. Um, of course, uh, you know, Aristotle was full of crap in a lot of ways, and he didn't understand a lot of things, but of course, working at the beginnings of knowledge and that kind of thing too. But uh, that was a problem for a lot of biologists for a very long time. Um, they didn't really understand how animals that were like these tiny little insects could have these complex societies, and they didn't really know why these existed at all. This was a problem too for Charles Darwin, and Charles Darwin famously uh, fretted about this issue in his On the Origin of Species, which is the foundational work for modern biology. So, first of all, what, what is a eusocial species? I'm throwing this word around. Eusociality is true sociality. A lot of animals are social, including human beings. You have, you know, dogs, fish, birds. They live in large groups. They kind of interact with one another for protection, um, to help feed each other, that kind of thing. But eusocial species are taken up a notch. Like they, they are able to do things and they have different kind of uh, patterns that we don't see in other kinds of social animals. So we look at uh, you know certain kinds of eusocial animals. They have certain characteristics. These were identified by E.O. Wilson, um, a problematic figure, but maybe that's a story for another time. But his ideas were that eusocial species have a reproductive division of labor. So there is a reproductive caste, and there is a sterile working caste, and that these ones had individual roles within these eusocial societies, and they didn't overlap. And this allowed for certain kinds of cooperative brood care, where they take care of the other's young, and there's also an overlap of generations. So you have um, multiple generations living in the same kind of colony environment. And so, of course, this is a definition that was very focused on the research back in the 1970s to 1990s, which was very focused on a specific group of organisms, the Hymenopterans. Hymenoptera is a big order of insects. So the insects have a lot of big orders, but this one is a particularly large one, and it includes your you know, bees, like honeybees, um, but also ants, wasps, and sawflies. And multiple times in the hymenopteran lineage, we have this eusocial kind of organism uh, pathway going on. Um, so, for instance, ants are all exclusively eusocial. Bees, many of them are, and then wasps, some of them are. And interestingly enough, the sawflies, none of them are. So there's multiple different kinds of lifestyles, you know, between solitary, social, and eusocial. However, it's not that simple, and it's not just hymenopterans that are eusocial. We also see it in the social termites. Um, eusocial termites are a type of cockroach that has evolved to live in these colony environments. There's now known to be things like ambrosia beetles, which also display signs of eusociality. Um, in the arthropods, we, uh, other arthropods, we also see these kinds of shrimp that live in little uh, um, like sponges. And they kind of live in a colony environment that way. And in fact, even in the mammals, the naked mole rats, for instance, there's evidence of eusociality. So eusociality is widespread in the animal kingdom. It's not one specific group, and it seems to have evolved multiple times. That does not mean that it's common. Um, in fact, if you think about the number of insects, something like 2% of them are eusocial species diversity-wise, despite the fact that they involve over 50% of all insect biomass. So while they're numerous as individuals, they're not common. And there's a few different reasons for that. Um, some of them include, you know, the fact that you have to feed a large number of individuals. And this is not an insignificant problem. They've adapted some major ways of dealing with this problem. But feeding a large number of individuals is very energetically costly. And it requires a some profound changes in foraging and food acquisition that a lot of other animals seem to not have. There's also the problem of epidemic diseases. So a lot of eusocial insects, for instance, have to adapt their behavior in order to manage the outbreak of diseases within their colonies. They will actually isolate infected individuals away from their reproductive uh, caste, the queens. Um, they will use grooming and uh, cannibalism and 
um, kind of graveyards that segregate and destroy infected individuals. And they also use um, like antifungal antibiotic uh, uh, bedding to prevent infections to the larval young. So they have a lot of adaptations to kind of manage and prevent epidemic diseases that other insects and other animals don't really have to worry about. But the most fundamental problem is Darwinian. Um, animals under natural selection, you know, they want to reproduce, survive to reproduction age and then reproduce in order to get to the next generation. It's not an individual desire like I want to read a book or I want to go for a coffee. It's a kind of a biological, you know, imperative. It's like a, it's kind of a, uh, it's a thing that shapes populations and this is the force of natural selection. Natural selection basically will weed out individuals that die before reproductive age and they will, you know, of course favors reproductive at all costs. So why do we have these social animals at all then? And this is a problem that, you know, Darwin tried to work through and his solution was that they were undergoing a thing called group selection. So this is kind of an outdated idea now, but Darwin seemed to think that Natural selection didn't just operate on the level of individuals, but also operated on the effect on the level of communities and populations, that kind of thing. So it wasn't just the you know survival of the fittest individual, it was the survival of the fittest group. And uh, this idea really was started to, you know, kind of unresolved until about the 60s and 70s, um, you know, with Wynne Edwards and his idea of um, group selection in the... Uh, um, I think, I believe a kind of bird, um, but it became a real kind of bone of contention. The Neo-Darwinians in the 60s, 70s, and 80s really started to push back against the idea of group selection, and they wanted to look at individual selection exclusively. And they were able to solve to their satisfaction the idea that eusocial animals evolved because of kin selection. So kin selection is a form of altruism where individuals that are closely related will actually you know, extend, um, you know, altruism, they'll, they'll give them resources, they'll sacrifice themselves, that kind of thing that they wouldn't do to other individuals. Um, and this is kind of predicated on the idea of Hamilton's rule. So the more related you are to an individual, the more likely you're going to sacrifice and the greater degree of sacrifice that you'll do. So um, the famous aphorism with this one is that I would sacrifice myself for two brothers or eight cousins, right? We share half of our genetic material with our brothers and sisters, uh, biological brothers and sisters, and then one eighth of our genetic relatedness with our first cousins. Um, so that kind of genetic sort of thing makes sense in mammals, but when you look at insects, they have different rules of um, male-female determination and heredity. So if we look at kind of these hymenopteran insects that I've already talked about, they actually have a very different way of sex determination. Uh, so we have XY, XX chromosomes, you know, it gets a little bit more complicated than that in mammals, but um, in insects, they have haplodiploidy. So ma uh, males, they only have, they're only haploid, so they only have half a genetic material. An unmated female honeybee will produce only males, but if she is mated to a male, she can produce females. Uh, so they have two sets of the genetic material. And this haplodiploidy if you work out the maths, it means that the uh, queen is actually three quarters uh, related to the worker bees, the sterile worker bees. So that means that the sterile worker bees, which are her daughters, are actually very closely related to the queen. And this means that the sterile worker bees will forego their own reproductive benefit for the queen. Um, and that means that they can you know, invest in her reproductive well-being by going out on these dangerous uh, missions to go get honey, taking care of the offspring, sacrificing their lives in defense of the hive. So that kind of explains some kinds of this sort of eusociality, but not all. In fact, there's been a recent review that showed that eusociality in hymenopterans is actually the minority in insects. And, you know, other insects don't have the sex determination uh, system, they have different systems for it. They also, um, not all hymenopteran insects, like I said, sawflies actually are eusocial. Um, they're solitary bees, they're solitary wasps, they're solitary sawflies. So that's not really a good explanation for all the eusocial diversity that we see. What is, 
you know, kind of gets a little bit more complicated, but there's some other explanations for why eusociality may have evolved as well. So one of them is that um, it's actually a colony defense strategy. Now, if you think about it, bees live in hives, right? Pretty basic. Uh, you know, uh, yellow jackets, which are kind of eusocial wasp. They live in paper uh, kind of hives. They, they look like a little like lantern or whatever. Um, termites live in mounds. We know that. Um, we know that naked mole rats live in burrows underground. All of these things have in common is that they live in a very easily defensible nest. It's like a fortress, right? So it's, it's a different kind of strategy than living out in the open or living in kind of something, you know, more basic than that, you know, like an open nest, that kind of thing. Um, we also talked about, you know, the, the, the shrimp that live in the little sponges, that kind of thing. So they have a defensible fortress. And as it turns out, there's actually some evidence that um, colonies will raid each other. Um, so there's wars between colonies in certain eusocial species. Uh, for instance, the, um, the thing that Darwin was most horrified about in the animal world other than parasitoid wasps, so I'll have to talk about that in a different video, um, was the idea of slave making. Now, Darwin was an abolitionist, um, which was easy because slavery was already illegal in the British Empire when he was you know, going on the Beagle and, and publishing on the origin of species. It wasn't, you know, it was still legal in other parts of the world, but he was an abolitionist and he thought the idea of slave making in other animals was abhorrent. Um, so when he was writing about the slave-making tendencies of ants, he had to explain that through the lens of natural selection to his utter horror and dismay. But um, what this could represent is possibly uh, a reason why the sociality may have evolved. We actually now have evidence that naked mole rats, you know, the little gross, they look like unmentionable things, um, they live underground and they actually will raid rival colonies both to steal their space, but also to steal their pups. And then they take the pups and they use them as a slave workforce, a non-reproductive slave workforce, um, using forced labor to basically take care of an unrelated individual's offspring. Um, this is wild, right? <laughs> Perhaps, and it's been suggested, that one of the reasons that eusociality evolved in the first place was that it's a defense strategy to prevent against this kind of raiding and this kind of warfare. So. Maybe sociality and eusociality is, is a defense mechanism. I mean, obviously schools of fish gather together to prevent against predation. Maybe eusociality evolved for that reason as well. I mean, that's one possible explanation. Um, another possible explanation too is that it's a highly adaptive foraging strategy. If you've ever seen those leaf cutter ants, um, what they're doing is actually, they're not eating the leaves, but what they're doing is they're taking the leaves and then bringing it down into their colony um, into their kind of nest, and they're actually using it to feed fungal farms. There's a few different kinds of insects that do this, termites do this. Um, we also know that uh, there is evidence that ambrosia beetles also do this too. But it's actually a kind of symbiotic relationship between these fungi that can only live in these colonies. And the, um, and, and the eusocial insects that are raising them, right? It seems that a lot of eusocial insects evolved right around the late Cretaceous to kind of Eocene uh, periods in geological history. So about, you know, that's uh, right around that kind of like 75 million years to, you know, like, I guess that would be like 35 million years ago, 40 million years ago, something like that. Geologists, uh, you know, don't at me, that kind of thing. But uh, if you think about it, this is actually the time period when flowering plants, the angiosperms come around as well. And the rapid evolution of these plants created a whole bunch of new ecological opportunities, and not just for cultivating these uh, kind of fungal farms, but also to eat the pests that live on these flowering plants, which a lot of, you know, animals like uh, ants do. They, they, they eat aphids and they drink their milk, but also the, uh, you know, evolution to you know, harvest these plants and to eat their seeds and also protect them, uh, that kind of thing. So, the rapid evolution kind of gave an opportunity for these eusocial insects, which are really good at foraging, to evolve. And this has created one of the most remarkable symbiotic relationships in nature, which is flower pollination, right? Honeybees. Honeybees, they go out and they um, basically drink the nectar from flowers, and then they take the pollen and they pollinate other flowers so that these flowers can reproduce. They depend on the bees in order to do that. And this is a very different relationship that we see in other kind of uh, species. I mean, you know, butterflies are also pollinators too, right? Uh, but 
there's a really strong correlation with the evolution of these eusocial insects and the evolution of flowering plants. So it's possible that this foraging strategy actually, uh, you know, the ability to have a bunch of workers go out and forage for you, may be one of the strong benefits of eusociality as well. There's also a third possibility too that I um, that, you know, we haven't discussed yet, and that is the benefits of cooperative brood care, right? Um, now, cooperative brood care is not simply something that we see in eusocial animals. I mean, humans do it, we're not eusocial. We do show some of the signs of eusociality, but not all of them, right? We're, we're social species. Um, birds, they often have helpers at the nest. So basically the older sisters are, and older brothers are taking care of the young um, from slightly younger, genera you know, slightly younger individuals. Um, so that's not uncommon, but you know, the eusocial insects and eusocial species otherwise are taking this to a whole new extreme. And this can ensure a greater degree of reproductive success than may be seen in other places. So in certain contexts, this kind of reproductive divisional labor can be highly advantageous, even if it's not super duper common. So to kind of wrap up here, what is eusociality? I mean, it is a highly adaptive and highly particular kind of niche of um, social organisms that, um, that we kind of see in insects, in mammals, in other arthropods, where there is a reproductive division of labor. And this allows for unique kind of defense and foraging um, strategies that we don't see in other organisms. Now, a lot of people like Aristotle, like Darwin, like to draw comparisons between human societies and eusocial societies. And you know what? There's some degree of overlap. I mean, we, we human beings have a reproductive division of labor in some cases. That's not a strict caste system, but there's definitely individuals who reproduce and some who don't. And that's more of an individual choice, or it might just be part of their life stage, you know? Um, we have menopause, which a lot of other animals don't. Um, you know, orca whales are famous for this. So, um, you know, so we can learn a lot from studying these, these social insects. The lessons that we take away have to be tempered by the realization that this is a strategy and that different strategies may work under different circumstances and that we shouldn't wet ourselves to one specific way of living simply because it's natural. So uh, Aristotle, you can suck it. Uh, <laughs> that's all I have for now. Um, thank you so much for watching. Um, please subscribe. Um, my blue sky is taking off in this channel. Eh, we could use with a few more subscribers. So uh, check it out, uh, my blue sky, if you haven't. Um, you could also subscribe here. Um, I will be doing a course in summer of 2025, so stay tuned for that. Um, and that's all for now. Leave a comment in the comment section below, and I will see you next time.